Welcome to the True Crime Librarian. I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Tonight's case is one that is still on the forefront of everyone's minds. Chris Watts and his desire to start life over. We've all probably seen something about this case. Pictures, videos, social media posts, or even the famous sentencing hearing where Chris kept his eyes forward as his loved ones speak about his horrible crime and the loss of Shannon, Bella, Celeste, and baby Nico. Chris's desires to remain speechless through the whole ordeal has just caused the country's interest in the case to grow even stronger. However, Chris is still very quiet about the details on what happened the morning of August 13th, 2018. All we can do is piece the details together on what he has spoke about and try to calm our curiosity regarding why a beautiful mother and her precious daughters and unborn son had to die. What in life was so bad that a simple divorce couldn't solve? How was an affair so amazing that it was worth the risk to kill the all-American family? Alright guys, let's jump into tonight's episode and let me introduce you to Christopher Lee Watts. He was born May 16th, 1985 to Ronnie and Cindy Watts. He also had an older sister, Jamie. She was about six and a half years older than Chris. Chris was said to be closer to his father and it's known that they did everything together. Chris would say he could be his real self with his father. He was also very close to his maternal grandmother, and she helped him learn the capitals, and he would eventually go on to learn the capitals in Europe. And this is where they recognize Christopher's photographic memory, and this comes to play for him later in life. Chris was really into sports. He loved basketball, baseball, football. He was a big Steelers fan. And he loved NASCAR. Him and his dad went to about 500 games together. And he would develop a natural talent for mechanic. At 14, Chris attended Pine Forest High School. Chris was described by his classmates as withdrawn, keeps to himself, uncomfortable around others. Chris was a introvert in every sense of the word. He would sit back and watch others, and some would say that psychologically Chris did not know how to express his emotions. They weren't even sure he feels emotions because he was very emotionless when the country was looking at him. And so psychiatrists have looked at him and, you know, there's, there's question. And if, he, if there is something there, it's said that Chris would watch so he knew how to act accordingly to whatever emotion he should have been feeling. But any sense of the word, he was an introvert. And introverts are very withdrawn. They, they do. They watch people. They sit back and they listen. They're very uncomfortable in large crowds. And they're said to not have a whole lot of friends. And Chris didn't either, not in high school. He never had a steady girlfriend. He didn't have a bunch of friends to hang around. But a classmate, Brandy Smith, described him as smart and gentle. He also identified as an outcast, and Chris seemed to understand her. They were not dating, as Chris never had a girlfriend in high school. Chris also had another classmate describe him as, quote, I've never seen him get angry at anybody. He wouldn't hurt a fly, end quote. Chris was, I mean, in the things that Chris did, it was to help somebody else along the way. It was to better that moment for them in life. He wouldn't hurt a fly, at least at this point in life. He just, you know, Chris just was, you know, he was that shy kid in the corner that never really said anything. And according to Chris later in life, he said, quote, I never really talked to many people. People knew who I was. I never spoke to many people. I didn't have a girlfriend in high school. I was under the radar. I didn't want to be a part of a group or a clique. I didn't want a whole lot of friends, end quote. 
In high school, Chris would enroll in automotive technology class, and he quickly became the star pupil. For Chris, because of the photographic memory, he could look at the engine and or look at the part and see how it went together so that when he took a part, he knew exactly how to put it back together after he fixed it. And this would play on later as he would go on to a competition where he was given symptoms of the way the car was acting and he had to fix it. And because he had that photographic memory, he was able to do so without any help from his teacher as that would have disqualified the team. Joe Duty, Chris's auto mechanic teacher, had this to say to Chris, quote, Chris, if ever I had a student who was going to be tremendously successful, it's you, end quote. Chris graduated in May of 2003, and Joe, his auto mechanic teacher, fully expected to see him as a NASCAR crew chief in life. And that was Chris's goal. He wanted to become a crew member for one of the NASCAR teams. So in the summer of 2003, Chris moved to Mooresville, North Carolina to attend the NASCAR Technical Institute. He rented an apartment with other classmates. He also got a part-time position at a local Ford dealership. So when he wasn't in class, he was working on cars. His dad, however, was hit very hard when Chris moved out because, you know, they were essentially the, each other's best friends. Ronnie would develop a cocaine addiction, and he later admitted that he was so depressed after Chris moved out, he just turned to the drug. It took his son staging an intervention for him to wake up, and Ronnie walked away without ever touching the drug again and without rehab. Chris was a major part in his life, and when he pointed out his dad's shortcomings, his dad was quick to correct them. In 2006, Chris graduated from the NASCAR Institute with honors. He had moved on to the full-time position at the local Ford dealership. He was sending out applications in hopes to join a crew. And since he graduated with honors, you would think that most crew members would want him as a part of their team. But Chris only received one call and one interview, and he was not offered the position. Even though he was disappointed, he never seemed to show it. He never complained. Instead, he bottled up those frustrations and kept them inside. And for Chris, this would become how he deals with stressful situations in the future. He did finally have his first steady girlfriend. She was coming out of a messy divorce, and Chris said this later about his relationship. Quote, I was helping her through a divorce, and then she went off with someone else, and I'm like, oh, nice to know, end quote. His cousin, Nicole Candy, would suggest to him to send a Facebook friend request to her colleague, Shanann Ruschek. Shanann was coming out of a bad marriage as well. Chris mustered up his courage and sent the request. It was months before he heard anything. So let me introduce you to Shannon Catherine Watts. She was born January 10th, 1984 in Pasek, New Jersey. She unfortunately died August 13th, 2018 at just 34 years old. She was born to Frank and Sandra Rusek. Her sibling was Frankie. Shannon was a very sickly child. She would be seen by many doctors for her debilitating migraines that she suffered from. And this would play a huge role for Shannon in her health going forth. Shannon had a vibrant personality, but she was very insecure and bullied in school. She would turn and become close with her brother, Frankie. This is what she had to say about her younger self. Quote, I had people who picked on me and said mean things. I wasn't the popular kid in the group, end quote. And when you see Shannon later in life, you, it's hard to believe that she was anything but popular. In 1999, Frank moved his family to Aberdeen, North Carolina. And at the age of 14, she began her high school career at Pinecrest High School. It is known for its arts and drama departments. Shanann would go on to join Matt Francis's theater class. He said this about his former student, quote, 
Shanann was a very insecure young lady who didn't have a lot of friends when I met her. She did not have a good self-image of herself, but she was brave enough to sign up for beginning acting, end quote. She ended up in a group that really cared about her and gave her the courage to just be herself and really just allow Shanann to thrive. She would become close to Colby Cruz and Claire Littlejohn. And through this tight-knit group, Shanann kind of took on the title of Mother Hen. And this is just who Shanann was. She cared for others and it was her every day to do so. Frances soon realized that Shanann's talents was more behind the scenes with organizing the props and scenery than it was out front with scripts. Frances would quickly become a mentor to Shanann in life, and if anything was going wrong, Shanann would kind of turn to Frances and, and talk to him and kind of talk it out. And Unfortunately, that's been reported that she said that her parents were going through a bad divorce and, you know, she needed somebody to turn to. But we know that Sandy and Frank never divorced. Um, now, I don't know if, like, maybe during the time they had talked of separation. I don't know. But for Shanann, because she had so many insecurities and she had been bullied in the past, she really cling to Francis because he had this authority figure and she didn't feel like he would judge her and so it made it really easy for her to just confide in him with all of her problems. The principal would soon take notice that Shanann was constantly in Francis's office for extended amounts of time. So the principal kind of redirected her to the counselor to really to somebody who just was trained to help her more. But Shanann didn't like that, and she continued to confide strictly in Francis. By her sophomore year, she had become a vital member of the theater team, quickly settling into the role behind the scenes which, where she shined. She was the stage manager and production person, and this allowed Shanann to kind of make sure everything was in its place and everything had its role. And this was Shanann's personality. She was very, you know, we're going to make a list and this is how it's going to go. And, you know, it keeps life in order for her. It keeps the chaos in order. So she shined here and she shined through several productions with the school. By her junior year, not only was she the stage manager and production team member, she had added the yearbook and other clubs to her very growing list of activities. She also took on a part-time job at a local pizzeria as a hostess, and it said that it's here where Shannon kind of broke out of that shy and reserved shell and became the social butterfly, just talked to everyone, and she was opening up to being comfortable with who she was. Shanann's senior year was filled with a fast-paced relationship with Leonard King, and by the time the two graduated, they were engaged to be married. Shanann was very ready to start life and to start building a family. Her senior quote was one from Muhammad Ali, quote, friendship is the hardest thing in the world to explain. It's not something you learn in school, but if you haven't learned the meaning of friendship, you haven't learned anything, end quote. Friendship and Shanann went together, you know, like sugar and water. They blended perfectly, and it was, friends were a huge part of her life. The young and ambitious Shanann went on to marry Leonard King shortly after graduation, um, like I said, she was eager to start her life. She was eager to start a family. And she had that in Leonard King, or at least she thought that's what she had in him. He would promise himself to the army as a means to go to law school and Shanann would start college. But it would soon show that Shannon couldn't take care of her husband and go to college and she would drop out so that she could have a full-time job selling pagers and cell phones. Shanann said this, quote, I started a bad relationship and quit college to take care of him so he could go to law school, end quote. That's who she was. She just took care of others. She made sure others shined in their dreams and wants. 
And in 2006, Shanann became the manager of the cell phone store in Fayetteville, and it was owned by Hisham Bedwin. And she would eventually become a bookkeeper for Hisham at his store called Dirty South. It was a custom car fittings and wheel company, and it was known for its very high-profile clientele. And Shanann worked long hours managing both stores because she was still part of the pager and cell phone store for Hashim. And then she was the bookkeeper for Dirty South, which was very lucrative for him since his high profile clientele obviously paid the big bucks. It would soon become that Shanann would no longer come home at night. And this was the beginning of the end to her marriage to Leonard. According to Leonard, the couple had started attending couple counseling sessions, but Shanann showed very little interest in fixing the young couple's relationship. She was hard to engage in conversation, and Leonard would say that, you know, he he barely could get anything out of her, and I, I guess that was the major flashing red light to him that his marriage was over because his wife was just not willing to try. And in 2007, Shanann and Leonard divorce. 23-year-old divorcee Shanann moved to Charlotte, North Carolina and enrolled in psychology at Queens University. And the divorce brought back all of Shanann's insecurities. I mean, she was probably feeling like she wasn't good enough. But at the same time, she really didn't want to put in the effort to make her relationship work. So in in hindsight, really, those insecurities came back because of something that she no longer wanted to work on. Shanann decided that she would build a home because she was tired of paying somebody else's mortgage. And so she found land out on Lake Wiley and a $309,000 home loan later, Shanann was building a luxurious brick mansion looking over Lake Wiley. The 4,000 square foot, four bedroom, four bath home was a product of Shanann and her work ethic. She worked tirelessly for Hishin at both locations and, and her hard work paid off. I mean, she built this beautiful home. It's like, it has like 12 rooms in the house. I mean, so you got four bedroom, four bath, but you have, so that's only eight, you got four other rooms in the house. It is a huge home for a single person. Soon after moving into the home at 1000 Peninsula Drive, Shanann's health took a turn. Quote, I was feeling extremely terrible to the point where I didn't want to get out of bed for days, end quote. Shanann would say this later about her early life when she was starting to get sick. And in May of 2010, she was diagnosed with lupus. And then she turned to Google, which we all know you should not do. But in the end, it freaked her out, and she went and sought several second opinions. And not only did they confirm her lupus, but they also diagnosed her with fibromyalgia. Both of these diseases put a stop to Shanann and her constant work. She would eventually leave her job at the Dirty South because she just couldn't do it anymore. In 2010, Shanann was at the lowest point in her life and had just received the second friend request from Chris Watts. She finally replied. Two weeks after answering Chris's friend request, the pair went on their first date. And oh, did Chris shine bright. <laughs> they ended up going to an epicenter theater in Charlotte. And this is one of those places where you can go and you can watch a movie and you can have dinner and cocktails. But it was also very fancy, and Shanann dressed up for the occasion. Unfortunately, Chris never got the memo because he showed up in t-shirt and camo shorts. And really, honestly, through the date, there really wasn't chemistry. And I don't know if it's because Chris was underprepared, or if he was overly nervous, or if Shanann just really wasn't interested. But... Chris would invite her on to a second date to a kid rock concert, and she took him up on the offer. And this date went a lot better, except his nerves were there again, and he ended up forgetting his ID in the car and had to run back and go get it, leaving her to wait on him. But at the end of the night, the two had a really great time, and 
lucky Chris, he got a third date out of it. In late August, Chris and Shanann would take a trip to Myrtle Beach. And on their way back home, Shanann's lupus flared up. She needed to lay down, and so she laid her head in Chris's lap for the entire drive home, which from what I can deduce is about three hours. And it said that he had to go to the bathroom like the whole time they were on the road, but he never budged. He let her lay in his lap so that she had some sort of comfort during this time that she was in pain. And for Shanann, this was the gesture that won her over. You know, he was the man of her dreams, and she she didn't think she could get any better. And really, honestly, that's not, you know, that's not an easy thing for someone to accept, especially early in a relationship, and for him to just allow Shanann to lay down and process and deal with what she was going through. That said a lot about who he was and about how he felt about her. As the couple started dating, Shanann would end up back at the Dirty South just part-time because she still had that mortgage on that beautiful home and she had some living expenses. And of course, there was medical bills from her lupus and so she had to have some kind of income. She began to dabble in photography, and this is how she would meet her friend and future employer, Gianna Dietz. Uh, Gianna would hire Shanann as their nanny while she was pregnant with her second child. She needed help looking after her 18-month-old son. And, and Gianna said, quote, she was a wonderful nanny to my little boy. During the end of my pregnancy, I ended up home quite a bit while Shanann was still there as my nanny. We got to know each other very well, end quote. Shanann was often in discomfort while working for Gianna because of her lupus and all the medication that she had to be on to kind of help control, and it still wasn't really under control at this point. But nevertheless, she put a smile on because she wanted people to see the fun-loving side of her. they they, she didn't want them to see and pity her because she was sick. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, a lot of her friends early in her diagnosis never knew she was even sick in the first place because she didn't allow them to see that side of her. But because that she was putting on that front, she ended up needing to depend on Chris a lot more. And he came through time and time again for her. He would help her organize all the medications that she was on. She would drag him to her rheumatology appointments. She went to a spine. He went to a spinal tap for her. He even joined her for her colonoscopy. Wherever Shanann needed Chris, he was there. And she fell in love with him along the way. By the time fall came around, Chris had moved into Shanann's new home and began sharing their expenses. But it wouldn't take long before Shanann took over the couple's finances, and that included Chris's savings, and he had saved quite a bit while working full-time for the Ford dealership. Shanann could not help show, but show Chris off to her friends, um, and they couldn't help but notice his slavish devotion to her. She said jump, and he said how high. Um, and, and that just gave her the okay to continue to be the dominant person in their relationship and Chris seemed very willing you know to do what she asked on November 25th of 2010 Shanann finally confirmed her relationship with Chris on social media and this would be the point where Chris became a huge part of her postings just a couple days after the Instagram post, uh, the couple invited their parents over. And this was not what they thought it was going to be. Sandy and Frank and Cindy and Ronnie showed up. Oh, and Jamie and Frankie. And they showed up and, you know, there's this beautiful home that Shanann has. She's not working full time, but Chris is living with her and he has a really good job. So to Cindy... It looks like she's using her son. So she starts to question how Shanann can live in such a nice house 
and have this luxurious life if she only has a part-time job. And this would piss Sandy off. Um, but Cindy was very vocal. She never really seemed to hide her feelings. Chris never received that side of his mother. And, but, you know, that's okay. I mean, not everybody's the same. But Sandy knew that Cindy would be a thorn in the couple's side throughout their relationship. And if they got married, even into their marriage. Um, Jamie would also share her mother's opinion about the couple and their relationship. And she said, she said, quote, we met her and we weren't sure, but we would do anything to make him happy because he was happy, end quote. And this was kind of their first impression of Shanann. So for the couple, they wanted their families to meet and to get along and mingle because they were in love. You know, Chris loved Shanann and Shanann loved Chris. And they, for them, it worked. The opposites attract for them. That just worked for them. But their parents just could not get along. Shanann and Chris would spend their very first Christmas at the Rusex. And this would be Chris's first holiday without his family. And it did not make Sand or Cindy happy. But, you know, when it comes to relationship and parents, you've got to do one with one and one with another. You don't always get to do every holiday with the same family. However, Chris and Shanann would ring in the new year with Frankie. Again, Chris would have another holiday without his family. In February of 2011, Gianna and Charlie Dietz moved to Colorado, leaving their nanny and friend Shanann behind with her boyfriend, Chris. And Gianna quickly began to tell Shanann of how the fresh Colorado air would do well for her lupus. Gianna was a nurse. And so she had a little bit of a medical background and, and, and understood kind of her di diagnosis. And so she just really had Shanann's best interests when it came to her health. She really had her best interests at heart. And in August, in August, Shanann and Chris rented a beach house in Ocean Isle Beach where Shanann's parents would join them. I could not find anything that said that Cindy and Ronnie joined them. I've seen a couple things where it was mentioned both families were there, but I couldn't confirm. So if they were, it's just not something that was talked about. But Sa Sandy and Frank were there. And Chris turned to Frank and following tradition, asked his permission to marry Shanann. And Frank couldn't be happier. Um, he gave his blessing immediately and welcomed Chris into the family. Chris would propose to Shanann on the beach where she would happily say yes. At Thanksgiving, the newly engaged couple went out to Colorado and visited Gianna and Charlie. Um, during their week visit, Shanann and Chris had decided that moving to Colorado would be best for them. And they immediately started looking at property. Unfortunately, with all their ties back to North Carolina, Chris would be the one that could move to Colorado while Shanann had to, you know, kind of tie everything off and sell the house and all that kind of stuff. So they would go home and Chris would end up moving to Colorado, living with Gianna and Charlie in their home for six months. Cindy hated their decision. She said, quote, Colorado was Shanann's idea. Why did she want to leave and to take him all the way to Colorado? End quote. His mom was very vocal about not always agreeing with some of the decisions that the couple made. And if she didn't like it, she immediately labeled Shanann as the instigator, which, I mean, I'm not saying it's not true. Don't get me wrong. It's probably true she was very dominant in their relationship, but Cindy was quick to place blame. And you and I both know, because of relationships, in-laws tend to hmm, be a pain for 
the spouses and Cindy was no better. As Chris moved out to Colorado to stay with the Dietzes, Shanann stayed behind and her and her mother began planning the engagement party. And for Shanann, she tried to bridge that gap between her and her soon-to-be in-laws. So she asked Jamie, Chris's sister, to mail out the invitations for the party. And she also asked her to order some food. And it had to be gluten-free because Shanann at this point was not eating gluten. It was not good for her. It made her body ill. Sandy would claim that most of the 80 invitations did not go out and that the food was not gluten-free, which meant that Shanann couldn't even eat the food at her own party. The couple's engagement party was not what they had hoped for, and Cindy accused Shanann of turning Chris against his family. At this point, Chris would break contact with his family. Um, he asked them to leave him alone. It's suspected that Shanann instigated the break years later. Chris said this, quote, I blew up at my family to a point where I said that I didn't need them anymore because I had Shanann. I cussed my mom out. I don't know if Shanann coached me to do it or if it was just rage like I've never seen before, end quote. While Chris lived with Gianna and Charlie those six months, he got a job at Longmont Ford dealership. And he began saving money because he wasn't, you know, he didn't have to pay rent. I'm sure he helped out with them, but he didn't have to, he didn't have all the normal expenses that one would have. So he was able to put most of his paycheck into the, you know, savings. And that way it'd be ready for when Shanann could move to Colorado with him. He also bonded with the Dietz's new daughter, Eva. And whenever she would get upset or angry or sad, she wanted Chris. She didn't, you know, she didn't want her mom and dad. She wanted Chris. And because of this, they really thought, you know, he would be an excellent father. And he was. I mean, don't get me wrong. He was a really great dad. Until, you know. Chris attended Central Piedmont Community College in Charlotte online. And this was at Shannon's constant persistence. And on April 22nd, Chris delivered a nine-minute video on relationships, deterioration, and repair. This eerily foreshadows his future in his marriage to Shanann. Um, I listened to this, and every key point he spoke about, I was like, dude, seriously? That, you know, hindsight's always 20-20. So he started out with, quote, the relationship begins to fall apart, crumble, or fail. You have weakening bonds. You get bored with an everyday routine. Even at job, you might meet a new person and it could strengthen into something else and weaken the bond you have with your partner. You have more awkward silences at dinners. You disclose less of your feelings and show less affection towards the other. End quote. When talking about moral obligation, Chris's speech sends a chill through your body as he almost reads what his future is. Quote, according to my research, sometimes the necessity can be children. Sometimes when your partner starts to deteriorate, a child could help repair it. A sudden break would be infidelity. A gradual would be in you met someone at work. Okay, maybe this relationship has more potential than the relationship I have with my partner. And it would gradually push the old relationship out and push the new relationship in. His research would show the more attractive one usually leads. Repair is not an option and they want to get away and start anew. End quote. In August, Shanann had sold the house at 1000 Peninsula Drive for almost 41000 more than she paid for it. She was then able to move to Colorado with Chris and into the Deeds' basement, where they would begin looking for their own home. Shanann also got a job at Longmont Ford dealership, and she would soon become their top salesperson. Her natural talent for selling things to people started shining bright. Soon, Greg Allure, the manager of the dealership, noticed how Chris would almost immediately hand over 
the envelope with his paycheck in it to Shanann. Shanann began making friends, and Chris would just tag along. Chris and Shanann had lived with the Deeds as one big happy family, so when they would all have their friends over, Deanna and Charlie noticed how Chris became noticeably uncomfortable, and if he had a task to do that was kind of in the background, it was better, but he did not like being put on the spotlight, but his wife was the hostess of, you know, the year. She, she loved being the center of attention. And Jenna said, quote, you almost felt sorry for him in a public setting, end quote. On October 17th of 2012, Chris and Shanann signed a $392,000 mortgage for 2825 Saratoga Trail. Their new home was still being built as the couple's wedding day is quickly approaching. Two days after they signed this new mortgage, their wedding website launched, and in lieu of gifts, the couples were asking for donations in their names to the Lupus Foundation. And Shanann made it very known that Chris's family was not welcome. And um, Chris was, you know, quick to follow suit. He, quote, Chris worshipped the ground she walked on, end quote. By Halloween, the couple were back in North Carolina making their final wedding preparations. On November 1st, they got their marriage license at Mecklenburg County Register in Charlotte. And on November 2nd, Jana, Charlie, Eli, and Eva flew in to attend the rehearsal dinner because almost every single one of their family members was part of the wedding party. On November 3rd, 2012, Christopher Lee Watts married Shanann Catherine Rusek. Shanann wore this beautiful Cinderella style gown and, and she had these rhinestone high heels that had I do um, etched in them. Chris wore a suit and he had a purple vest and bow tie on and I'm sure this was because he was supporting his wife's lupus diagnosis. His purple is the color for lupus awareness. The reception went full swing. They had a Steeler themed wedding cake and Chris even stepped outside of his comfort zone and performed a Magic Mike like dance. Um, but noticeably missing was his entire family except for his grandmother and he would dance with her during the traditional groom and mother dance. Frankie later said this about the wedding, quote, I was crying, thanking God for him being in my sister's life, end quote. On November 4th, 2012, the couple set out for their honeymoon in Myrtle Beach. Although they really wanted to go to Cancun, their finances just, it wasn't in the cards for them. Either way, they still had a great time. And by the winter, Shanann was actively trying to get pregnant. But her lupus medication made it very hard to conceive and she would download an ovulation app and then she also began fertility treatments. And for those of you who have struggled with conceiving, you know how expensive fertility treatments can get. When they failed to conceive, Shanann ordered a $7,500 supercharger for Chris's beloved Mustang as the consolation gift. And it would be that weekend that they conceived Bella Marie. April 2013, Shanann and Chris finally get to move into 2825 Saratoga Trail. Their 4,100 square foot home was in Chris's name only. On May 16th, Chris celebrated his birthday and his gift that Shanann had bought as a consolation gift was wrapped up and waiting for him on his toolbox when he got to work and he was so excited. She did really good. In July of 2013, Shanann started a new job at the same pediatric emergency triage unit that Gianna worked for. On July 9th, Shanann announced Bella Marie on Instagram. She was holding up a baby dress with the caption that said, Bella Marie Watts coming Christmas 2013. So excited. And Shanann, she really was. She was more than prepared for the arrival of her first child. 
Bella had a closet that was like bursting at the seams with new clothing. Shanann had gone out and bought a top of the line crib. She, you know, she made sure that her daughter wanted for nothing. And quote, Shanann and Chris were racking up their credit card debt and the couple was oblivious. On November 3rd, the couple's very first wedding anniversary, it was spent at a baby shower for Bella that Shanann threw. She made new friends with Jeremy and Jennifer, and they recall a time when Jeremy arrived to take Chris to the airport, but Shanann made him finish cleaning before he could leave, and it was almost childlike. She almost treated him childlike. You know, he wasn't allowed to go and, and do anything until he had completed the task she had asked him to do. Jeremy said, quote, she's meticulous with everything. Everything had to be clean, end quote. And when you see photographs of their home, it's, it's spotless. It's always spotless. So, I mean, and it's not a bad thing that she wanted to keep everything clean, you know. It just makes life easier. They're, the less chaos, the less mess you have, the less stress you tend to have. On December 17th of 2013, after 16 and a half hours of labor, Chris and Shanann Watts welcomed Bella Marie Watts into the world. Just one week later, on Christmas Eve, Chris dressed up as Santa for their daughter's very first Christmas. This would become a tradition in the Watts household. 2013 was an eventful year for the Watts family. They moved into their new home that had just been built. Shanann got pregnant. They had their very first daughter. It was just a very good year for them. In 2014, Ronnie and Cindy Watts flew into Denver to see their son and their new granddaughter in the first weeks of the new year. They had not seen Chris since the engagement. And Cindy said this about Chris, quote, Chris always seemed anxious and when she needed something, he would run. It was very odd. He just seemed nervous. Cindy also said, quote, I tried to like her. I tried to love her. And at times I did love her. But then it just started all over again because she always found something wrong with us. End quote. Chris took to fatherhood well. He would give Bella a bottle. He would reach her at night. He changed dirty diapers. He could not dote on his daughter more. She was just the cutest little thing. On May 24th, Chris left Longmont Ford because Shanann had found him a better paying job with Covenant Testing Technologies in Greeley, Colorado. Chris was also starting to suffer from carpal tunnel syndrome from the consistent uh, movement with his hands. So him leaving was really good for him and his health. Shanann really had a full plate at this point. Um, she was still working her night shift. She had a part-time job. Plus, she was up all day with, you know, taking care of Bella. And then she started dabbling in direct sales for custom jewelry companies and instant coffee companies. And if you don't know what a direct sales company is, it's Color Street. It's Premier Jewelry. It's it's those ones that you sell on your own time. It's like a Mary Kay. If you can remember Mary Kay, you know what direct sales were. I think they're the original direct sales company. In July 2014, Frankie, Shanann's brother, joined the Watts family in Colorado. He was contemplating moving there, but... While he looked for work, he would stay home with Bella, and he loved it. He loved being able to stay home with her. But by mid-August, he was having trouble finding a job, so he flew home to Aberdeen. And it's mentioned several times throughout the Watts story about Frankie's shortcomings. He, he just, I, I don't know what his deal was. I don't know what he was going through. I, I don't, but... It seems like the family really kind of fixed whatever problems Frankie had. And this was just one of them. A week before Christmas, Shanann and Chris would tack on to their debt one more time with a 2015 Ford Explorer that they would lease. 
They were hemorrhaging in debt, and it would soon catch up with them. On January 10th, 2015, Shanann celebrated her 31st birthday by announcing her new pregnancy. She shared a photo of her holding her new baby bump, and the caption read, 12 and counting. Chris also had started a new job at Anadarko Petroleum, and he was earning $61,500 a year. At the beginning of March, Shanann was showing Bella off proudly on social media as the 15-month-old started walking, and she would show a picture of Bella trying to walk away as her dad kind of held on to her, her waist. Just a few days after this post, she would announce the new baby's name, Celeste Catherine. In the following weeks, Frank and Sandy moved into the basement at 2825 Saratoga Trail. They were there to help their daughter out with their 15-month-old granddaughter as Shanann was going through her second pregnancy. Frank would find work in construction, and Sandy went to work in a salon. Chris would later say that the Rusex living with them was stressful, as Shanann and Sandy would often argue about how to raise Bella. The first week of June, Chris and Shanann's spending would finally catch up with them, and they would have to file Chapter 7 bankruptcy. They owe $450,000. 70000 was on credit cards, and then there was medical bills and student loans. And their income had fallen from 150000 the previous year to only 90000 in 2015. On Friday, July 17, 2015, Shanann gave birth to Celeste Catherine Watts. Poor Celeste was a very sickly baby and was diagnosed with EOE, or eosinophilic esophagitis, an allergic swallowing disorder. Celeste would need steroids in her first year alive to, to just breathe. But both Celeste and Bella were very sickly and would regularly need medical attention. In August of 2015, a judge would discharge most of the Watts' debt. All they had to do was complete an online credit course. So the two took the test, passed the test, and most of their debt was charged off. It was gone. They didn't have to pay it. Lauren Arnold, a friend of Shanann's, would say this about the little she knew about the couple's finances. Quote, Shanann never seemed stressed out about finances. She just mentioned that they got behind on things and they argued about it sometimes, end quote. Chris would claim that all of this took him by surprise as she handled all their finances. Remember when they were at the dealership and he would almost immediately hand her, her pay, his paycheck. And I mean, it, it started that way when they first moved in with each other. Shanann took over his finances then. So it was no surprise that she was handling them now. However, Chris assumed that she was paying their bills. Readily apparent by their Chapter 7 bankruptcy, she was not paying the bills. And Chris was frustrated. But he didn't say anything. He didn't do anything. He bottled it up and pushed it down and just ignored it. Mid-January of 2016, Shanann signed on as a promoter for Thrive, whose parent company is Lavelle. This new job brought new friends for her, and it could be lucrative, and since Shanann had a natural salesmanship, it was very lucrative for her. It also allowed her to have an even more powerful presence on social media. And this is the part that would begin to alienate Chris and his introvert personality. He did not like being on social media. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to be on videos. He didn't want to take pictures. He just was content in the background. Shanann would persuade her out-of-shape husband to start taking Thrive, and he eventually signed on to be a promoter as well, but she ran his 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 sales for him. Um, she told him nobody could ever know that that she did that, that, you know, it, it wasn't allowed or it was frowned upon. Um, but with Chris being the introvert that he was, if he ever tried to really kind of go out and talk to anybody about Thrive, he would just stumble across his words and, you know, he, Shanann just, she was better at it than Chris. Within five days of Shanann signing up, 
she had signed on two new customers and already sold over $800 in Thrive products. And this earned her very first milestone, which is called the 800 VIP. And just a week later, she would hit the second milestone, which was the 1600 VIP, because she had sold over $1,600 in Thrive products. Shanann's salesmanship was shining with this direct sales company. And since her husband was taking it and he was seeing some of the immediate effects and there was measurable difference, Shanann used him and his experience for her to sell the products. And I mean, it paid off well for Chris too, because at this point he's a promoter as well. So Chris's experience and his, you know, drastic change in his physical shape did well for both of them in the company. By April, Shanann had smashed through several milestones, but she hit the big 12K which meant that she earned $800 a month for a car allowance. And she chose a Lexus, a white Lexus SUV. But Chris would have to trade in his beloved Mustang. And this pissed Ronnie off. He was not happy about this. You know, he knew his son. He knew he would do the trade in and not say anything about it and not pitch a fit. But he, Ronnie also knew that this would hurt Chris, but Shanann never seemed to see that. And if she did, well, Chris never mentioned it. Chris never said, you know, I, I can we, is there another way? He just said, okay, you know, he went along with it. At this point, Chris had been working for Anna Darko for about 16 months. And his coworkers had given him the nickname Silver Fox because he was starting to kind of go gray. He also gave him the nickname of Rain Man. And that's because Chris's photo, photographic memory fared really well in this working environment. And so he was, you know, he was able to learn how to take care of these batteries and different leases very quickly because it didn't take him a long time to memorize anything. Luke Eppel, his boss, considered Chris a very valuable part of their team. By the summer, Shanann was preaching Thrive on Facebook, and she was using Chris and his experience to sell it. Chris would later admit that he obviously hated being on social media. He was just not built to be that kind of person, and Shanann was, but Shanann's experience and Chris's experience Chris's experience were not, not the same. Shanann's mom, Sandy, would introduce Shanann to Nicole Atkinson, and soon Nicole became part of Shanann's team, and the way these direct sales companies work are you sign up, okay, and so whoever you signed up on is your team leader or ahead of you in the team, and they would earn a certain percentage off of what you sold. So for Shanann to have multiple people sign up underneath her meant that her income became even more because she was earning a percentage of their sales in her income on top of what she was earning with her sales. Nicole will play a very valuable role in Shanann's disappearance later. By September, Shanann had hit the 40K VIP brand promoter and she was going to great lengths to show off not only herself and Chris, but Chris as a team. And she made the hashtag Team Rockstars their personal brand. She would stage elaborate photos on Chris's behalf. She was working not only for herself, but she was working for Chris as well because that just meant more income. And eventually Chris hit his 12K status which means he earned the covenant car bonus as well. With their constant presence on social media, it always looked like they had the perfect life. And many of us know that what you see on social media is what others want you to see. You don't get to see the ugly part. You don't get to see the ugly side of things. You know, you see the happy, you see the celebrations, you see all of that. And for Chris and Shanann, 
because their their photos were mostly staged, you only saw the good part of their marriage. And this is what made them be the all-American family because they seem to have it all. Lauren said this about the couple's relationship, quote, people that don't know her would say that maybe it's a front, that she's trying to portray a perfect marriage, but that's how it was, end quote. And for them, it really was. I mean, they had the ugly side of things. I mean, every couple does. But Shanann loved Chris, and Chris loved Shanann unconditionally, both of them. You know, they just almost could not get enough of each other. But Shanann's dominant personality kind of was wearing Chris down. And that's the side you don't see. And I'm not making excuses. Don't get me wrong. We're not making excuses here. I'm just saying that on a person that is similar to Chris and his very introvert ways, that is almost crippling to be put out and, and for the world to judge. And it's, it's mm, the anxiety that comes along with that is a lot. At this point, Shanann was contemplating quitting her job at the children's hospital. I mean, Thrive was making her money and it was making her good money and she was good at selling it. And her thought was that if she could devote full time to promoting Thrive and selling Thrive, that it could be even more money for them. So her leaving the children's hospital was something that was in the back of her mind. I guess, and I guess at this point in, in, in the story, Facebook had began its live streaming because Shanann from this point forth loved to go live. She loved to be in front of the camera and the camera loved her and people loved to watch her. People flocked to her videos and they watched and they were curious about what she had to say. And this increased her presence on social media tenfold. But that meant that it increased Chris's as well. Through the couple's constant promotion of Thrive, Shanann and Chris ended up earning their very first getaway with the company. And it was a trip to New Orleans. They would attend a masquerade ball where Shanann wore this beautiful purple ball gown. And it had a slit that went all the way up. And she had this beautiful masquerade mask that matched. And Chris wore an evening suit. And then he had a Phantom of the Opera style mask that he wore. You know, again, there's a lot of pictures that come from, you know, these trips and all the things they do. Because Shanann is selling the lifestyle. She has to make it look so glamorous and so easily obtainable to everybody who sees it that's the only way she's going to make money so that meant that she had to put out more photos and chris was becoming very uncomfortable in his role in shanann's social media but again instead of saying anything he bottles it up and pushes it down and doesn't deal with it and this is just a recipe for disaster it's a ticking time bomb with the holidays fast approaching, Shanann's constant photo and video presence increased tenfold. She had money to make. She had, you know, she had the holidays to pay for. She had two little girls that she wanted to give the world to. And she was going to work as hard as she needed to in order to do so. And that meant that she would start er, she would start using their personal money to create competitive incentives and prizes for people who bought thrive or who signed up as a promoter underneath her she just she tried to sell this glamorous easy job that she was doing and it worked i mean i'm not going to lie she she was one hell of a salesman for the company by mid-November, Shanann was fully prepared for the holidays. Both girls had gone to the mall and seen Santa and had their pictures done. Um, the family had two Christmas trees that Shanann had fully trimmed. I love Christmas. One of my favorite holidays. And a friend of Shanann's on social media challenged her for two weeks to share what she was grateful for. And... Chris 
was at the top of her list. I mean, she, she doted, you know, it, she was very dominant in the relationship, but she doted on her husband. Like you would never believe the constant positive things she had to say about Chris and all that he did for their family was there every day, multiple times a day. She could not tell the world enough how the man of her dreams was the best thing to ever happen to her. Shanann would close out that two-week grateful post challenge with one for her in-laws, saying, quote, It was a rough start six years ago, but today we are closer than ever. I am blessed to have supportive, motivating, and, and encouraging in-laws. They are amazing grandparents and an amazing second parents for me, end quote. Shanann was really trying to bury the hatchet. And yeah, we only get one side of things, mostly when it comes to true crime. Sometimes you get two, but very rarely do you get the whole story because there's always three sides to every story. There's one side, there's the other side, and then there's what really happened. Now, I'm not saying that Shanann was the perfect daughter-in-law. I could see that she's not with her very dominant personality, okay? But at the same time, I can't help but question how much effort was being made on the other side. Shanann was very passionate in her family and how she raised her daughters. She just, she did not like being second-guessed. And I, I don't know if the challenge was there from the in-laws, questioning whether or not what she was doing was the best thing she could do as a parent. I don't know. I'm just saying it seemed as though that she would extend, you know, the white flag out to her in-laws saying, okay, truce, let's try this again. And I could be wrong. It could be one of those moments where, you know, we fake the perfect life on social media. So let's put one up about the in-laws. I, I don't know. In the first week of December, Celeste ate two small cashew nuts and ended up having a very severe allergic reaction. She was rushed over to Children's Hospital where she had to be treated with an EpiPen and prednisone, which is a steroid, and then Zofran because she was vomiting constantly. It was at this point that Celeste was diagnosed with a severe nut allergy. On December 17th, the family celebrated Sweet Bella's third birthday party with a Princess Sophia theme. But on the very next day, Bella was rushed to Children's Hospital. Both Bella and Cece had been diagnosed with croup at this point. On January 1st, 2017, Shanann shared her vision board to help her and her family attain their goals for 2017. Shanann was huge on vision boards. Her very first vision board almost 10 years prior was how she ended up building the gorgeous home back in North Carolina. Since joining Thrive, Chris's appearance was ever-changing. He was eating healthy, he was going to the gym, he was running every morning, and his co-workers remembered that he drank water like crazy, like two to three gallons of water a day. That's a lot of water. Shanann's posts had started to become more and more personal on social media as well. She would share about Chris, she would share about the girls, but there were hints that not all was perfect as she made it seem. Their neighbor, Nathaniel, and I'm going to butcher this last name, I'm so sorry, Trinistich and his wife recall hearing Chris and Shanann screaming at each other late at night. But whenever the neighbors would see them, they were loving and affectionate to one another. So every marriage. You, you have arguments, and sometimes, especially when you're young, those arguments get very loud and passionate, is what I'm going to say. Each party, you know, thinks they're right. And I've always said this, and I still say this, the hardest thing for any person to do is to admit that they're wrong. So when a couple is fighting, 
you know, one wants to be right, the other wants to be right, but neither one of them are going to say, you know, no, I was in the bad. I was in the wrong. I'm sorry. Sorry. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. We're, you know, people are very stubborn. By the end of January, Cindy and Ronnie were arriving to Colorado. They were going to watch the girls. Even though the Ruseks were still living in the basement of Chris and Shannon's home, they had jobs that they had to go to, so they could not care for the girls full time. So Cindy and Ronnie came out to Colorado to watch them because Chris and Shannon were off on another earned trip from Lavelle in the beautiful Punta Cana. This was, this was almost their second honeymoon because they really wanted to go to Cancun for their honeymoon, but it just wasn't in the cards for them. But now they were leaving the country to this beautiful beach resort. And so for them, it was like a second honeymoon. While there, Shanann took Cindy out for manicures and pedicures. And she would sign her father-in-law up as a Thrive promoter as well. And I laugh. Because seeing Ronnie on TV and interviews and he just does not seem like a person who would be, you know, hey, buy this stuff for me. You know, he just didn't seem that way. He's very much, Chris got his, his personality from his father. He really did. Because Ronnie's a little on the reserve side. I wouldn't say he's fully 100% just in the background, but he is more reserved than Cindy. Although, he hit the 4K status, which is the very first milestone. Or, no, that's like two, three miles. I don't know. It's, it's a couple milestones in. He hits that with just in a few days of signing up. I would suspect that Shanann had a lot to do with selling it for him while they were in town. On January 31st, the couple finally set off on their beautiful trip to Punta Cana. But back home... Cindy, Ronnie, Sandy, and Frank were not getting along. Now, I mean, don't forget, you know, the Ruseks were in the basement living. And so Cindy and Sandy have not got along since the first time they really met. Sandy later said that, quote, Cindy brought them upstairs and stayed upstairs, end quote, not letting Frank and Sandy see the girls. Sandy and Cindy ended up in a screaming match in front of the girls. They just could not get along while Shanann and Chris were gone. That match, that, that fight, would be the last time that Sandy and Cindy would say anything to each other. A couple of weeks after the, the fight, um, Sandy and Frank moved back home to Aberdeen. They claimed that Frankie was having issues, which meant he was not paying the bills in the house or the mortgage or whatever and they were in danger of losing their home due to their son's neglect so they had to go home that's according to them by easter the watts had gained some more new friends they had some it's really hard to keep up with all of shenan's friends she had a ton she was likable it was easy amanda and nick thayer Amanda was the Primrose School director where Bella was attending preschool at this point. I had become friends with them. And at this point, Chris is down like 40 pounds. Okay. So he does not look like who he was when they got married. No, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure Amanda signs up as a promoter under Shanann too. Only she does not, she's not one that commits full time. And that's okay because she had a different job that paid a lot better. At the beginning of April, Shanann finally turned in her badge and computer to the children's hospital, quitting. She was devoting full time to the Thrive Direct Cells. Full time. The same week that she quit, now, Ronnie and Cindy just went home in the beginning of February, okay? This is the end of April. They're coming back out again to Colorado. And Ronnie and Cindy said that flying out to see them twice a year was becoming financially straining on them. It was not easy, but if Chris called and said, you know, I need y'all here, they'd get on a plane and they'd be here. At this point, Cindy had noticed that something was not quite right 
in Chris and Shanann's marriage. And she couldn't pinpoint what it was, either, or she never says what she saw. But at this point, she's noticing there's something different. On June 5th, 2017, Cece would join Bella at Primrose School. Their annual tuition for this school was $25,000. Again, the couple was draining their finances even more than before. Over the next few months, Chris had lost about 20 pounds and had converted the basement into a gym, becoming a stickler for his workouts. He was doing these patches. He was doing the, the shakes. He was, he, was, he was doing it all. And Chris was very pleased with his results and he wanted more. He, j- he just, he needed more. And for him, it was about the only thing that was regular in life. On June 17th of 2017, Princess Celeste would turn two. But just two days after her birthday, she would be admitted once again to Children's Hospital for viral pneumonia. These poor babies could not catch a break when it come to getting sick. They got sick at every turn. And some would say, you know, it has a lot to do with Shanann's health when, in, you know, when she was younger. Soon, a new employee started at Anandarko, a young Nikki Kessinger. She was turning heads of all the men, and although Chris had noticed her, The two never exchanged words. Not at this point. They hadn't exchanged any words. However, on August 3rd of 2017 at 11 p.m., Nikki Googled Chris Watts for the first time. Just one month later, she Googled Shanann Watts. And with Shanann being a promoter of Thrive, most of her Facebook was public. Shanann had suffered with migraines ever since she was young. And at this point in her life, they had gotten to the point that she was ready to have a permanent fix. So she decided to have arthroplasty neck surgery to fix a degenerative disc in her neck. And in mid-August, her friend Christina Meacham flew in with her daughter from Hawaii to help Shanann after the surgery. Because at this point, Shanann's not working, Thrive is full-time, but Chris can't take off that kind of time from Anadarko. Shanann needs help. Christina would recall this about her time living with the Watts. Quote, she's my sister. I would be her right-hand person until she was healthy enough. End quote. Over the two months that Christina lived with the Watts, Christina was impressed by Chris's devotion to his family. I mean, he'd come home from work and he'd give the girls baths. He would read bedtime stories. He was part of their every night routine. Um, and for him, that was another constant routine for him. And for an introvert, you know, the less changes you make to the routine, the better it is. But she also noticed that before Chris really made any decision, he referred to Shanann. And it would be minor decisions, and he would refer to Shanann because it had to be done her way. And in order to keep the peace, so to say, He would turn to her and ask, is this, you know, do I do it this way? Do I do it that way? Christina just pointed this out. Um, And again, it's not saying, don't take me wrong. I'm not saying Shanann's the bad guy here. I'm not. Don't put words in my mouth, okay? She was dominant. That's just who she was. That's who she was when she was a young child. She just was not in an environment that allowed her to thrive that way. And now she was. Chris was happy making others happy. And Shanann really needed that in her spouse. It helped her become the best person she could be. And so for her to be able to have that control in her own home was very sated for her, very secure. So for Chris to refer back to her before really doing anything It's not necessarily a bad thing, okay? He just wanted to make sure that she, he was taking, not only taking care of the girls, but he was taking care of Shanann as well. Just before Shanann's surgery, Shanann and Christina sat down for dinner and drank through a bottle of wine. And 
Shanann would confide in Christina about how the couple struggled financially with everything. I mean, I want to say their mortgage was like $2,600. They have this car payment on the Lexus. At this point, Chris has a, a truck from his job. And then, you know, they, they just have all these expenses. The kids are constantly sick. Shanann's six and a half this surgery. They have a car payment. They have a house payment. They have, you know, homeowner association payments. They have all of these things that they've committed to. It's just they've overcommitted themselves. And they cannot seem to make enough money to stay ahead of the game. Chris drove his wife to Littleton Adventist Hospital where she underwent anterior cervical disectomy and fusion surgery. The very next day, Chris would take to her social media, letting all of her friends know that the surgery went well. On the third week of Shanann's recovery, Christina and Shanann drove into Las Vegas to attend the annual Team Relentless training party. And this was part of the team that Shanann was in Lavelle. She, this is who she kind of signed under. And Chris stayed behind, and he was there to take care of Bella, Celeste, and Coral, which was Christina's daughter. Shanann was very self-conscious about having to wear the neck brace during her trip. And one of her friends kind of jokingly pointed out, saying, Just tell somebody that you have to wear it because you got bit by a shark while you were in Australia. Shanann loved it and ran with the story. That's what she told everybody that whole weekend they were away. In early October, Christina and Coral were able to fly home, and Shanann was finally able to remove the neck brace. She was preparing for the couple's fourth trip, this time to Puerto Vallarta. And Chris was still losing weight. At this point, he was wearing two patches, two of these weight loss patches. And the shakes and the water and the healthy eating and the consistent, you know, working out. Chris was toning himself up, and he looked completely different in, from the time they married to, the, to this point. He was just a whole new person, and it was just, it was for the better. It was supposed to be for the better. On October 12th, the couple went live from their beach resort hotel, showing everyone this beautiful hotel in paradise. And during this trip, Shanann would post several romantic photographs of her and Chris. But Chris just, as time went on, he became become more and more unenthusiastic about things. He just, you know, before he would, he would be just as lovey-dovey with Shanann as she was with him. And, you know, time went on and it just wasn't the same. On Christmas Eve 2017, Chris once again donned the full Santa getup and played Santa for his girls. However, Bella and Celeste wanted no part of that. They were at that stage where, that's who's this scary man in red in a beard and I can't see who he is? Who is, why, why are you making me see him? Why are you making me sit on his lap? They didn't want anything of it. So Chris comes into the house on the cue that the couple had kind of decided on, and Shanann is filming live. She's Facebook live, showing the girls getting to see Santa. Of course, it was a disaster. And Shanann asks Santa, you know, where's your phone? I need it for pictures. And Chris says, you know, you left it in the garage. So Shanann, frustrated, gets up and goes after the phone. And she turns the camera on her at one point, and she's like, my husband, the genius, you know, it's just, your kids aren't really going with what you wanted them to. This is not turning out the way you wanted it to. And then, you know, you're running live on one, one phone, so you need the other one, so you make sure you get your pictures. I can see where her frustration is at. But Chris, he's just unenthusiastically going with the flow at this point. Um... He just is not into it, and the girls aren't into it. Nevertheless, Shanann ends up with her photos, her annual photographs, and she posts them proudly. On New Year's Day of 2018, Shannon had vowed to double her team sales, 
which she was selling at $720,000 annually, somewhere in there. And she said, quote, because I want to show my little girls how to achieve their dreams and inspire them, end quote. On January 6th, Shanann held her annual vision board party and Miss Bella made her very first uh, vision board. And on hers, her goals were to own a pony watch, have gymnastic lessons, and do a trip to Disney and a trip to North Carolina. Bella was on it. She, she knew what she wanted and she was going to go for it. Days later, Shanann would share her 34th birthday dinner. And, of course, it was a dinner between her and Chris. And it was a photo of her and Chris again. And, again, Chris is not happy. They go on a trip shortly after her birthday to Las Vegas. And while they're in Las Vegas, they're attending different things at this convention. And one of them was that they got to test drive some Teslas. And Chris had never worked on an electric car. He had never worked on a car that was as high-tech as a Tesla. And so he gets behind the wheel and, you know, they crank up the Metallica, which is Chris's favorite band. And he absolutely loves it. And, and Shanann, of course, goes live for it. So, but you can see emotion in his face. And he just, he had a good time. And both of them enjoyed the Tesla, but Shanann really wasn't sure. And at this point, she was going to combine her car allowance and Chris's car allowance because he had his work truck and they were, and she was going to use it for her and she was going to go and get a new car. Her choices were either a new Tesla or a new Audi. And she was leaning strongly towards a new Audi. The couple is living beyond their means once again. Chris is bringing home roughly $62,000 a year at this point. Shanann's bringing in about sixty grand off of her Thrive. And they're still living paycheck to paycheck. And that's got to be hard. <sighs> you know, they've got, they've got all these medical bills from the girls. And then Shanann just had the surgery. And so they've got that. They've got credit cards. They've got their house payment. They've got... They've got all these things and they've just stretched themselves beyond their means. But Chris isn't taking care of the finances. So, you know, the blame kind of lays on Shanann in this moment. She stretched the family beyond what they were bringing in. In March, Chris receives a warning letter from Chase. Remember, his name is the only name on that mortgage. And it says that they are three months behind on their mortgage. And their mortgage is roughly, I think I saw somewhere it said like $2,600. So three months behind, they're almost 10 grand in the hole just on mortgage payments. So as a last ditch effort to catch up, they take a loan out against Chris's 401k in the maximum amount, which is 10 grand, in order for them to sink it completely into the mortgage payments and get themselves caught back up. But you just pull from retirement. It's not always the best decision in the world. I get that it may have been a last resort. You don't want to be kicked out of your beautiful home, especially when most people don't realize what kind of financial trouble you are really in. On March 12th, Bella was back at the children's hospital with some breathing problems. And two days later, Bella and Celeste both go under an adenoidectomy with bilateral tubes. They didn't have their tonsils out. They just had their adenoids out and tubes were put in to help their ears drain to counteract all the infections that they were having. This was supposed to increase their health in the long run. In the spring of 2017, Shanann and Chris were actively trying for baby number three. It's reported that this baby was Chris's idea. And, you know, he wasn't in the place to be having or making a decision to have a third baby because he wasn't really sure if he was in this relationship for the long haul anymore. But on April 26, Shanann flew out to New Orleans for Lavelle's annual Thrive-a-Palooza. And this was a big weekend for Shanann. Lavelle was launching the very first edition of their new magazine, Strive. And Shanann, Chris, and the girls were featured in the very first edition. It's her success story. It was, it was just something, it was an achievement she was proud of. 
And Shanann shows up for the last evening event, and it's a dinner, and they're presenting awards. And they present Shanann with a framed copy of the beautiful blow-up picture of her and her family, and then the story of Shanann and her Thrive experience. And Shanann celebrates the moment, of course, on social media by posting a picture of her with the framed edition with the caption, dreams do come true. On Mother's Day, Chris gave Shanann a gold plaque and it had all of their important dates in their lives uh, etched into it. There was Shanann Catherine, 1 10 1984, Christopher Lee, 5 1685, Our Wedding, 11 3 12, Bella Marie, 12 1713, Celeste Catherine, 7 1715. By this time, Chris had lost so much weight, his wedding ring was no longer fitting on his finger. And he refused to go get it resized. So he just walked around without his wedding ring on. And although he, you know, he told Shanann he was on board for baby number three, at this point, he'd fallen out of love with her and he was wanting out of their marriage. He just didn't know how to go about doing it. Chris reported that Shanann would criticize Chris in front of the girls. And because the girls were so young... They were starting to repeat those hurtful words to their dad. And this really hurt Chris, made him angry. And what did he do with all those feelings that he did not know how to deal with? Yeah, he bottled them up, pushed them down inside, and refused to deal with them. On May 29th at 3.40 p.m., Shanann had set up her phone in the kitchen and it was recording. When she stepped in front of the camera, she was wearing a shirt that said, oops, we did it again. She had one hell of a surprise for Chris when he came home from work. When Dieter, the family dog, welcomed Chris into the home, he walks into the kitchen and he's in view of the camera. And he hesitates for a second as he reads Shanann's shirt. And she's off camera. You can't see her. And he says, quote, we did it again, he asks. I like that shirt. Really? Really, Shanann's voice can be heard, although she's still off out of view of the camera. And Chris steps out of view as well, and when he steps back into frame, he's holding a pregnancy test. And he says, quote, so pink means his confusion has him nervous. And it's apparent that Chris is not totally thrilled with this news. Like he should have been for a person who was supporting his wife and the fact that they were actively trying for another child. And Shanann says, that's just the test. And he says, I know. Is Pink going to be girls? And Shanann says, I don't know. It's just a test. And he says, that's awesome. And then he kisses her. And he says, I guess when you want it to, it happens. Wow. There's almost the hint of disappointment in that last statement in Chris's voice. He wants out of this marriage. And now Shanann's pregnant with their third child. And there's no out that he can see. Shanann was quick to tell everyone. And the friends that really knew her and knew the girls and their health were concerned about them having another child. And although Chris, it's said that it was Chris's idea to have a third child, he was scared. His co-workers all congratulated him. And Anthony Brown asked Chris how he felt about becoming a father again. And Anthony says that Chris was very unemotional during this conversation. Chris asked Brown if him and his wife wanted another child and at this point they had suffered several miscarriages and so brown just was like i don't think it's in the cards for us and then chris says jokingly well you want one as if he meant that anthony and his wife could have one of chris's children on june 1st 2018 chris began having trouble with an app that he used in the field that helped him monitor some levels 
And so he went to the health and safety representative, Nikki Kessinger. This is the first time the two had spoken. And Nikki recalls this about the first conversation, quote, it was pretty casual and he didn't have a wedding ring on his finger, end quote. Five days later, Nikki emails Chris, their supervisor, Luke Apple, and others regarding her progress on the app. Watts replies back, thanks, Nikki. Have a great rest of your day with two exclamation points. Why is that important? Well, when you go, you can go and look at Shanann's Facebook. It's, it's memorialized at this point. But whenever you look at anything, Shanann never just uses one exclamation point to get her enthusiasm across. She uses multiple. And when we were talking way back at the very beginning here, I know it's been a minute, but we were talking about how Chris seemed to step back and watch people. And some would say it's because he was trying to learn how to mimic how one would present themselves based off of the emotion. Well, Chris had watched his wife for years promote her social media using multiple exclamation mark points to really sell her enthusiasm. Chris now is using that same technique when he speaks with Nikki. After the exchange of the emails, the two begin running into each other in the hallway at work. On June 11, 2018, Shanann posts the pregnancy announcement video. Then she went live to tell Bella and Cece that, quote, Mama has a baby in her belly, end quote. Chris is behind camera working the camera, and Bella is so excited that she wants to give, you know, the baby in Mama's belly a hug. So that's not really sure what they're talking about. Such a cute. <laughs> I mean, it's really cute to watch them all interact with each other. And at the same time, it's very hard to watch because that's not something you'll ever see again out of them. Shanann would stage an Instagram photo of Bella and Celeste. Bella was dressed up as a teacher, pointing a ruler at this little chalkboard that they had hanging up. And on the chalkboard, Shanann had wrote, Big Sister 101. And Celeste is sitting on the floor facing the board like, I have no idea what's going on. Cute little picture. Perfect way to announce, you know, their third child. The next morning following that post, Chris and Nikki would end up having their very first conversation. He started out talking about his kids and then said, quote, yes, I have a wife, but we're getting separated, end quote. Nikki later sends Chris this email. Chris, thank you for being honest with me this morning. Truthfulness is so underrated in our culture. Saludos, Nikki. One hour later, Chris responds to the email. Nikki, I'm a straightforward guy. Lying just complicates things. I think you're absolutely stunning, and from what I've learned about you so far, you seem like an amazing person. I hope to continue to get to know you better since we have a lot in common. Nikki is quick to respond. It's always nice to find people you can relate to. I enjoy talking to you as well. I feel understood. I'm looking for someone to build a beautiful life with. Seems simple, but it is unrealistic sometimes. Build something similar to what you have done with your wife and those cute little girls. I do believe in karma, so out of respect for myself, you, and your family, I think it's best if we keep that friendship at work. Less than two hours later, Chris responds with, Yes, a beautiful life is something that is hard to find in this world, since people always seem to have an agenda for everything. I do believe in karma, so I agree with that as well. Any conversations we have will stay between us. No need to worry there. He then emails her his work number in case she needs to get a hold of him. These are the last emails the two will exchange using the Anadarko email. On June 17, 2018, Shanann and the girls present Chris a shirt for Father's Day that they had made special for him. It read, I'm a proud dad of two awesome daughters who love the Steelers. Shanann also films Bella singing from the backseat of the Lexus 
with a song she had memorized just for him. My daddy is a hero. He helps me grow up big and strong. He helps me snuggle. He reads me a book. He ties my shoes. You're a hero through and through. Daddy, daddy, I love you. Shortly after this, Chris adds Nikki's contact information to his work cell. He was taken with Nikki and patiently awaiting the trip that Shanann had planned for her and the girls. They were going to North Carolina for six weeks. He would be home for five of those. Chris later says he never thought anything would come of his relationship with Nikki as he never had been pursued before. But as he and Nikki got to know one another, he began coming out of his shell. He claims he was being, quote, his true self. On June 19th, Shanann had a doctor's appointment where she got to see baby number three. She posted a picture of the sonogram with the due date of 1-31-2019. Her cell phone password would be changed to 0131-19. On June 21st, Frank flew out to Colorado to watch the girls as Chris and Shanann were going on another trip to San Diego. Frank immediately noticed something different with his son-in-law. On June 26th, Shanann and Chris flew back to Denver where Chris had a letter waiting from him from the Mindham Hill Master Association. They were being sued for $1,538.80. $683.80 was for past due fees. The association was also seeking attorney fees and court costs. This did not change Chris's plans that he had in place for when his family left. Chris would drive Shanann, the girls, and his father-in-law to the airport, and he would say goodbye to his family. When he returned home, he immediately called Nikki, arranging to see her after work the very next day. Chris Watts seemingly had the all-American dream, a wife and 2.5 kids, a beautiful home, and what seemed to be the perfect marriage. You may ask why we went over so much detail of their life prior to Chris's affair and the eventual disappearance and murder of his family, but this is a case that requires a full background in order to understand the crime, not because his wife drove him to doing it, not because he doubted his kids biologically, and even though they had financial trouble, it wasn't because of money. There was something more to Christopher Lee Watts, more than just the stress of life. Shanann thought she had found the love of her life, the man that genuinely loved her, who gave her the life she always wanted. But on that fateful night in 2010, Shanann unknowingly invited the very one that would take her life into her heart, home, and bed. Looking back at their life, you can see why so many have different stances on this crime without knowing of Chris's guilt. But at the end of the day, the only thing Shanann is guilty of is being the dominant person in their marriage. She knew what she wanted and went for it, and she was going to make sure that the man she loved reaped the very same benefits. I want to thank you for joining me tonight on what seems like a wild ride of life, and truly it was. There is so much evidence in this case that it is more than what was used to prove Chris's guilt. And in order to understand the story, we had to start somewhere. If you haven't listened to A Mother's Love, the Gabriel Fernandez case, go back and have a listen. If you want to know how an internet obsession can drive one to annihilate his entire family, then check out Toxic Obsession to Love. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode and drop a five-star review on whichever platform you're listening from. As always, I will leave you with a one-liner. We will never know the value of a moment until it becomes a memory. Much love, the true crime librarian.